So as 2021 draws to a close, we have lots to celebrate. For some, it was yet another year of surviving despite continued challenges and adversities. For others, many others, it's those challenges and adversities that actually turn this into some of the most success, largest consumer direct successes we've seen at wineries across the board. So that's what we're gonna be diving into today. Hello, my name is Leslie Berglund, and let's take a look at what we'll be covering today. First of all, Remy from Wine Pulse is gonna walk us through some of the metrics from 2021 at a high level. And then Zach from, from Commerce 7 will take a deeper dive into some key findings that we're seeing across clubs, across digital and tasting room. And then I from Leslie Berglund from the Wise Academy will talk about some of the key takeaways and lessons that we get from 2021 and how that might inform our planning and focus for 2022. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And so we do invite you as you go, put questions into the Q&A function. I believe the upvoting mechanism is turned on. And okay, let's uh, introduce the panel. So Zach and then Remy, I'm gonna ask you to take just a minute to quick overview uh, of your company and the data that you're pro providing today. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, so so yeah. my name is Zach Campus. I'm the head of business development here at Commerce 7. And Commerce 7, if you're not familiar with us, we're a winery direct to consumer sales platform. And uh, as we go through the presentation here today, I'm going to be talking about quite a bit of our aggregate data. And just for all of your knowledge, our aggregate data, it's made up of about our uh, 750 winery clients. And 80% uh, of those clients are based in the US. So that's where that data is coming from there. Okay, great. And Remy. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Remy, and I am the owner of uh, OnePulse. Uh, OnePulse is a reporting solution providing analytics to wineries so they can track their, many of their DTC metrics, many trends, many, uh, many information. And uh, we have now nearly 150 wineries using our platform which give us um, an interesting perspective of different trends in the industries uh, across many regions. Great, thank you. And again, I'm Leslie from the Wise Academy. We've been working, actually, <laughs> the season of COVID has dramatically changed our business. And in the year 2021, we've already worked so far year to date with over 4,000 wine industry leaders and professionals, and over which includes a few hundred wineries. So I'll be picking up lessons from our work with them. Great, let's start from the top. High level trends of what we're seeing so far year to date. Remy, I'll let you take it away. Okay, so this is a good year for the industry. And uh, you can see here, um, you know, um, so the rate of change, median rate of change for all clients across sales channels, across regions, and overall, um, uh, on average, the rate of change for the DTC sales of the wineries they are up 21%. Um, so you can see that uh, obviously testing room sales uh, rebounded very strongly this year compared to uh, 2020. Nobody would be surprised by that. Uh, a very strong performance uh, from the Napa uh, region. Uh, where tasting room sales year to date compared to the same year to date in 2020, they're up over 100%. Um, another trend that uh, you will not be surprised is that when we look at online sales, on average, the median rate of change, uh, online sales are down 17% for, for wineries using uh, one pulse. But overall, and that is a number to remember, is that overall DTC sales are up uh, 21%, and this trend is true across regions uh, and across, with the exception of online sales, across sales channels, as one club sales are up also strongly compared to last year. Now, Remy, something more interesting is to take a look at the 2021 versus 2019, because as you said, some of this is not surprising. We had Absolutely. insane digital growth in 2020 Absolutely. for all the obvious reasons. Let's take a look at what's really happened over yeah, the last year. Nobody is surprised that tasting room sales are strong, online sales are, are down on average. But now what about if we compare 
year today 2021 compared to year today 2019. And uh, what we see is that wineries adapted so much and so well to all these ups and downs and median rate of change for overall DTC sales per winery, uh, it's up 29%. So, but there is a little bit of disparity depending on the region. Um, a consistent overperformer uh, as a region is Oregon. They, they, they had a pretty good year actually in 2020 and they're having again a very good year in 2021. Oregon wineries are doing well and the median rate of change is around 44% uh, for our clients in Oregon. Now, but you can see that, um, for example, Central Coast doesn't enjoy the same growth uh, at that time. Uh, and there is a sub-region uh, that is also very strong, it's Texas. Uh, some of our largest clients are in Texas and uh, they are enjoying you know, very strong uh, growth in their DTC sales. Now, if we look at, okay, um, of our clients, 85% of our clients have increased their DTC sales in 2021 compared to 2019. So what does it mean? It means that a very large number of wineries are, have been enjoying steady growth even compared to 2019, uh, that there is a little bit of disparity depending on the region, but from a DTC standpoint, the industry is doing well and that's what we're seeing in the numbers. Now let's look at some specific sales channel uh, comparing 2021 versus 2019. So we saw earlier that online sales are down 17% in 2021 versus 2020. But, and that is a good news, when you compare year to date, 2021 versus 2019, you see that online sales are up 158%. So extremely strong growth last year for online sales, lower growth this year, but overall the median rate of change is plus 158%, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, that being said, it's very interesting to see that when you look at the number in 2021 versus 2020, Yes, online sales are down on average, okay, but 30% of our clients have been, able, have been able to increase their online sales in 2021 versus 2020. So yeah, most of the time people say, yeah, sales are down this year for online sales, but that is, it depends on the winery. It really depends on the winery. Now, when we look at tasting room. Yeah, actually, before we go into tasting sure. room, a couple things that come up to me as we talk about digital here is, first of all, the huge increase over the last two years, to me, what that means is the customer has changed really forever. It wasn't just during, it wasn't just during quarantine where we were all buying a lot more online, but that has continued. So I think that shift in terms of, We've had digital for a long, long time. We've been ready. Finally, the customer is really ready. So I think, I think we're seeing that, that a lot more people are buying online on an ongoing basis, not just in quarantine. I find it fascinating that, and we see this with our Wise Winery partners as well, that 30% of the wineries were able to grow digital even over and above an insanely huge lift in 2020. And so... Any, and I'll open this up to, you know, maybe Zach, any, anything that you're seeing from your data, and then we're going to get into some more details in a second, but any common lessons out of those winners, those 30% who are really killing it off of a very high base of what's happening there? Yeah, definitely. We'll get that to, uh, to that in detail for sure during my segment there. But I, you know, I think you're absolutely correct where there's a, a ton of, a uh, ton of people went out during COVID. They bought online for the first time ever. And for many of those people, you know, if the, if the shopping experience was a good one, that, that became a new buying behavior for them, right? It's not a, kind of a one-time thing or just during quarantine kind of thing. You know, it's a new behavior for them. It's a new preference. And you know, I think the wineries that did a, a, a phenomenal job of uh, creating great online shopping experiences, making sure they were fast and easy and personalized. You know, I feel those are the, the wineries that are really having a lot of success here. And they're seeing uh, the consumers that had a good experience with them you know, they're not just one-time buyers, they're, they're becoming repeat buyers through that channel there. 
The trend that the trend that I saw building on that is the trend that I saw is there was a group of wineries who just said, okay, great, digital was super in 2020, but it's obviously not going to be that good in 2021. And so whether consciously or subconsciously almost de-emphasize it. They didn't have their foot on the on the gas pedal as hard as they did in 2020 about it. So it might have led up just a little bit saying, eh, there's no way it's going to be as good. But you know what? There's a subset of wineries who said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the consumer's finally here. This is a time to invest. invest. This is the time to lean in. And those are the ones that um, are really excelling here. And we went back. I had, you know, I had this question of saying, okay, out of those 30%, did they just do not a lot in 2020? So it wasn't hard to increase. No. Like, well, these were mostly people who did well in 2020 and even better. Absolutely. Uh, and they tend to have a very proactive strategy for their online sales, very proactive in how they segment and target some very specific group of customers with specific offerings um, that will appeal to this subset of customers. And I think if, when, you, when you are proactive uh, with your online sales, it pays off. Yeah. And if you're just waiting for the orders to uh, right. say, hey, to show up, uh, yeah, it's going to show up last year, of course. And so but that's how year, I, that's more difficult. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly how I would, I would separate this out. This 30% is they leaned in, they're proactive. This is just the beginning. And the other 70% gave, gave up is not the right term, but it's really more, they were just more passive about it and just assumed it wouldn't be as good. Okay, let's dive into um, some more lessons here on the tasting room. So tasting room sales, again, no surprise, very strong this year, up 68%. For the year today, compared to the same year to date in 2020. But the good news is that compared to 2019, tasting room sales are up uh, 19%. Uh, I mean, the median rate of change is 19%. So that's a good performance. But again, here you have to make some distinctions. It's not across the board. Uh, same thing here nearly 30% of wineries have lower tasting room sales in 2021 versus to the same period of time in 2019. I was not expecting that, um, but it's a, it's a reality. And, you know, so of course the business model is a little bit different now through reservations, through some days not being open, it has an impact. Yeah, this number surprised me as well. I was hearing anecdotally that, oh, just the change in the guest experience. So it's twofold, going to reservation in some cases means we're receiving fewer people changing the guest experience from belly up to the bar three deep on Saturdays to private seated experience, well-spaced, uh, it can be fewer people. Um, but also I know there are a number of high profile direct to consumer wineries who are still not open seven days a week because they can't get the labor. And so I think that's also influencing this somewhat uh, the good news is, though, even some of the wineries who are seeing lower tasting room sales versus 2019, the majority of them are, that may be buried because they're actually seeing higher revenue because of the higher conversion rate and average order value um, of what's happening with these higher end new guest experiences. Super. Thanks, Remy. Let's go, let's uh, take, oh, I'm sorry, we had one more, Wine Club. <laughs> wine Club. Very important channel, as we all know. Um, so what are we seeing this year? Uh, number of club sign up in 2021 versus 2020, and again, same period of time, uh, up 45%. So we get the confirmation that there's a strong correlation between testing on traffic and new club sign up. Okay. But still, when we compare 2021 versus 2019, number of club sign up, the median rate of change um, is uh, over 9%. Uh, so that's a good news. Uh, we also looked at the attrition rate uh, as it's one of the measures that OnePulse is doing for, for all the clients. So attrition was a touch lower in 2020, uh, below 20%, uh, much lower than 2019, which was over 22%. The good news is attrition so far this year is at 20%. Uh, so it's fairly stable to com compared to 2020 and much better compared to 2019. So when you combine a fairly stable attrition rate and an increase in the new club sign up, well, what do you see? 
you see a very strong growth of active members in club. Year to date, the median rate of change for the number of active members uh, for wineries is up 8.3%. Last year was not so good because there were a lot less club sign up and some attrition. So the wineries on average, they were losing 3% of their members in 2020. But this year it's coming back. And yes, they have increased their uh, number of active members by over 8%. Again, it's a median rate of change. But when we look at pair winery, what did we see? We saw that 80% of wineries have increased their membership in 2021, which is very good. Uh, attrition rate is so stable compared to 2020. And for the moment, at least, very strong correlation between testing on traffic and new club sign up. But I know Zach will mention uh, interesting uh, uh, topics around online sign up in a moment. Yeah, it's not, yeah, not just tasting room. We've got other good things going on there too. Before we get off the slide, one thing I want to point out, it may not seem like a big difference, okay, in terms of the attrition rate. Going into COVID, we were at 22.5%. Now we've been at 20% essentially a little bit less last year. It may not seem like a big deal, 20% versus 22.5. It's a huge deal. <laughs> that is more sticky. They're more loyal. Um, and so something that for all of all of our wineries to be really proud of. Now, da Zach, let's go into a deeper dive of out of all the data that you see in the innards of Hummer 7, what are some key trends? Yeah, definitely. So I'm gonna start off here by going through uh, some club insights we found from looking at our aggregate data here. And gonna start off by talking about uh, flexibility with clubs, right? How many wineries or how many clubs are, are flexible to a degree being user choice? How many actual individual shipments, individual club shipments on Commerce 7 are, are flexible as well? And we can see looking at our data here that the majority of wineries on Commerce 7 are offering their members some level of customization, right? 74% of clubs are user choice. 67% of shipments are user choice. So there's, uh, you know, most people are giving the members some level of uh, flexibility customization there. If we take a look at our subscriptions, uh, which is by far our most flexible option, right? Uh, subscriptions are similar to user choice clubs, except that they're even more flexible. They not only allow the member to customize the products in the package, they can also customize the uh, shipment frequency as well as the individual shipment dates. So very, very uh, customizable. We see that on our platform, 32% of wineries are trying out subscriptions in some level. And that uh, actually 3% of all members on Commerce 7 belong to a subscription club, right? So we've seen this number grow pretty steadily here over the last year. Uh, really exciting to see people trying this out here. And in terms of how this is impacting the consumers, impacting the actual members, Right. You know, most wineries giving members the option to flex, uh, to customize, you know, how many members are actually taking them up on that. We can see that, uh, you know, about 26 percent of, uh, of members are editing their shipments. So about 26 percent of shipments are edited. And we know that you can get this number even higher if you're a bit proactive about encouraging the member to uh, to engage with and edit the shipment there. Right. Uh, for our, our winery clients who are sending their members uh, emails before the shipment processes, encouraging them to edit that 26% edit rate goes up to 30%. The winery clients who are not being proactive there and not sending out that message, uh, they're only seeing about a 23% edit rate in the packages there. And uh, the edit rate is actually really important. Uh, as a winer, you should want this as high as possible. And I'll explain why here in a second here. We see that when members are editing packages, you know, first it's increasing the revenue for you as a, as a winery. We see that uh, about there's about a 26% uh, increase in SKU count for an edited package and about an 18% increase in order value for an edited package. Right? So when members are, are editing those packages, the, the order value is going up. It's not going down. They're adding more than they're removing. Uh, and so the revenue is going up there. And so big benefit there of having that flexibility, right? Revenue is going up. We also see a good impact on uh, retention. We know that uh, the, if, a, if a member edits a package in the first year, the chances they churn in that first year go down about 22%, right? So not only is the revenue going up, but the, the members are sticking around even longer if they're editing those packages there. And uh, these two kind of factors compound on each other, right? They combine. 
And what we see is that uh, over the lifetime uh, tenure of a, of a club member, right, those who are editing, the lifetime value goes up about 63% over their entire tenure there, right? So they're adding more per package, they're sticking around longer. And, you know, over their entire tenure here, we're seeing this have a really good impact on uh, the lifetime value uh, just in the club there for, for those members there. So I love the story this data tells. It's something, again, we've known forever anecdotally that if we can move our club members from you know, any passive role where they're just receiving shipments to any type of active role, meaning they have some agency in, uh, in personalizing their orders or any other activity, activity that we can do, they'll stick around longer. So it's awesome to, to have the supporting data for this. Mm -hmm. What's the exactly. next step? Exactly. Yeah. So next, uh, I'm really excited about this stat here, online signups. Uh, we saw that uh, in 2021, 19 and a half of uh, user choice in traditional club signups came from the web. And very impressive here, 47.6% of subscription members signed up from the web. So I had a feeling that the subscription members uh, would sign up a lot more frequently from the web. I didn't think it would be quite this high, but really excited about this. The reason that I feel this is so much higher for subscription members is because there's a it's a lot more value for uh, those members if they're not local, right? If you think about a lot of the benefits and value of the wine club, it's a lot of great member benefits, free tastings, member only events, you know, pickup parties, things like that. Those are all really great and you should continue to, you know, use those. Uh, but if you're not, uh, if you're not a local member, if you're in a different city or in a different state, you know, it might not be a ton of value for the, you there with those localized uh, benefits. With the subscription, being that it's so convenient, so flexible, you know, there's value there uh, regardless of where you're located. You know, if you're out of city, out of state, it's still very convenient, very flexible, being able to change not only the products, but the frequency, the individual shipment dates. And a lot of the value comes down to being uh, just really convenient and really flexible there. And uh, therefore we see, you know, much higher online signups uh, with the subscription that has more flexibility there. So a couple of things here. I know as uh, we as consumers beyond wine are more used to the subscription model. And that's something else that's changed even more dramatically over the last two years. So having that access also doesn't surprise me that such a high percentage of the online signup. One really important thing on the traditional club members for online signup is pre-COVID, uh, it wasn't that high. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it, and it just... It was this, oh, and there's a few signups online that are happening, but the majority of the dependency was on the tasting room. And so back to what Remy said is great, online, new online, um, excuse me, new wine club or signups are up even versus 2019. It's not all tasting room. It's this is a lot that's driving it as well as the mm -hmm. consumer wakes up digitally. Definitely, yeah, it's, it's risen across the board. And so, you know, I would encourage you as a winery, if you're, uh, if you're looking at your website, looking at the club sign up on online, you know, just ask yourself, is, it, is this tailored for somebody who, uh, you know, might be signing up online from a different city or a different state, right? Uh, be great to see, um, you know, it's awesome to see all the localized benefits, but throw in some non-localized benefits there as well uh, would be kind of what I would encourage there because yeah, we're definitely seeing this kind of grow across the board, not just with the subscriptions there as, as Leslie mentioned. Uh, another thing on the club here to go over, we found that uh, last year was taking on average about 4.17 orders before a member would sign up for the club. Uh, so, you know, I, I believe, Leslie, there's kind of a notion that, you know, a lot of the signups are happening. They got to happen in the tasting room immediately. And, and, you know, that's where you're getting them. And that might be the case for, for a lot of signups. But we're seeing here that it's, you know, you really got to kind of nurture those, those guests and those, uh, those customers before they're actually converting there to a club membership. Right. I really call this the myth buster slide because a lot of wineries have the bias when someone is in the tasting room is it's like club or bust, I either sign them up for the club member or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if no, if we actually capture their contact information and can have a long term relationship with them, the number of orders it takes before uh, before members sign up can be much more than that. But we won't get mm -hmm. any of that if we don't capture that contact data. Exactly. Yeah. And so we'll get more into the importance of the, the contact data in a bit here because uh, we've got a lot of great stats around that. But next, we're going to talk about uh, the e-commerce insights we found here. So starting off with uh, how people are, are visiting and interacting with the site, right? Desktop versus mobile. 
we see that the majority of visitors to the website are visiting from a mobile device, about 54, 55%. Uh, that being said, most checkouts are actually happening on desktop, right? So most people are coming to the site on their phone, but most people are actually making an order on the desktop. And, uh, you know, why might that be? You know, at Commerce 7, we feel that's because it's a lot easier to check out on the, on the desktop. You don't have to fill out all those fields with your thumbs on your phone. You have the, uh, the auto-populating data and things like that. Uh, and so if we look at, um, you know, Commerce 7, it's important for us to figure out kind of how we can make it easier for people to check out on a, on a mobile device. It would be great to see, uh, you know, the, the checkouts, the checkout completions kind of in line with the visitations there. Uh, we have a one-click checkout at Commerce 7 here, right? Just going back to kind of making it easier for people to check out on a mobile device. We see that about 48% of mobile checkouts are one-click checkouts. Not about 62% of desktop checkouts are one-click checkouts. So we see people do want this, this kind of ease of checkout when they have the opportunity. Uh, on the next slide here, talking a bit about personalization, right? Really important and really impactful to personalize the experience you're given to, to customers online based off of uh, the context of your relationship. Right? Earlier, Leslie talked about how there's a, Remy and Leslie talked about how there's those 30% of wineries who did better in 2021 with their e-commerce sales. And you know, one of the things that they're doing is they're, they're personalizing online, making it really, uh, really easy and really uh, intuitive for the customer to kind of see content and products that are specifically tailored for them. Uh, this data here, this is from last year. Unfortunately, we're not able to run this data again due to some changes we made with our platform. But well, last year, we saw that about 15% of our winery clients were utilizing personalizations in, in some form. About 13% of products were viewed from a personalized page. And yet about 46 or 47% of ad to cart clicks were coming from a personalized page. So despite being viewed less, they're converting more. Uh, when you combine all these numbers together, basically ends up being that uh, there's about a, almost a six times increase in add to cart click uh, conversion rate from personalized pages versus static pages, right? Uh, to be fair, I don't believe this is solely based on these pages being personalized. I believe that the wineries that are implementing this, they're also doing a great job with their email marketing and their SEO and how they design the site. And they're, they're the wineries that are investing a lot more into the e-commerce experience, uh, but still great, uh, great correlation there. Uh, on the next slide here, we'll talk about discounts a bit, right? We took a look at how all of our clients were, were structuring their online discounts. We saw that about 23% of e-commerce orders had a product discount, about 17% of e-commerce orders had a shipping discount, and about 11% of orders had both a product and a shipping discount. Uh, you know, to be blunt here, this is actually a bit, uh, a bit disappointing, and I'll explain why. Number one reason for uh, card abandonment or checkout abandonment is shipping costs, right? We know from looking at our research, we know from looking at, you know, industry leaders like Baymart e-commerce research that uh, shipping discounts are valued to the consumer a lot more than product discounts. And that shipping costs are the number one reason why somebody's going to abandon their card. And so, you know, we're going to try to encourage our customers here rather than having the product discount online, uh, always opt for the shipping discount. It's more valued by the consumer. Uh, it's going to make more carts convert. And, you know, that way you're not also discounting the, the product there and, and, you know, kind of uh, devaluing the product to a degree there. Hey, Zach, I'm going to interrupt you because there's two questions that have come up in chat that are relevant to this. First of all, yep. are these e-commerce discounts exclusive of club member discounts? It's a good question. Yeah. So these are these are discounts across the board, regardless of, uh, of uh, the type of consumer receiving them. So basically 23% of orders, this is Oh, I think I understand the question better now. So yeah, this is not this is not club shipping orders. This is strictly uh, e com one off e commerce orders. Right. So some of these orders may have had a club member discount if you give your club members you know ten percent off or something like that across the board, and they made a one off e commerce order that would be counted here. Uh, but these are strictly just e commerce orders, not club shipping orders. Okay. And then back to the previous um, slide, it just, uh, we have one question like, what do you mean by a personalized page? Just to make sure everybody understands. Yeah, exactly. So a personalized page is a page where the content and the products on the page uh, changes based on who's visiting the page and your unique relationship with that visitor. So a good example would be Amazon, right? Everybody in the webinar here could go to amazon.com right now. We'd all have a different homepage. We'd have different recommended products. 
different recommended offers, uh, you know, different rec different shipping rates based off where Amazon knows we're located, right? Amazon personalizes the experience we have on the homepage based off the context of who we are and their relationship with us. And so that's basically a personalized page, right? On Commerce 7, it's changing the products. It's, it's utilizing our personalized collections and personalization engine to change the products, change the content on a page. Uh, so it's different based on who's visiting that page. And that way it's more, it's more tailored to the visitor. Some examples of how people are doing this if you know the visitor is local, you could highlight upcoming events. If you know they're out of state, you could highlight uh, shipping incentives. If they're a club member, you could tell them about member only events. If they're a repeat buyer, but not a club member, you could highlight the benefits of joining the club, right? So tons of ways to do this, but it's basically more a more tailored uh, approach to, uh, to, for, your, for your, uh, your online visitors. Uh, and we see it have a good impact on, uh, on conversion there. Uh, back to the discounts here, right? For the, you know, when we do look at uh, shipping costs and things like that, we see that on average, uh, if shipping is not discounted, on average, wineries are charging about $16 for shipping per order. And when shipping is discounted, either uh, discounted or, or free, uh, we're seeing that it costs about uh, $4 for an order there for shipping costs. Uh, Finally, here we're going to get into the, the tasting room insights. Uh, these are probably the ones I'm most excited about here. So when talking about the tasting room, one thing that became very obvious and apparent to us going over the data is that it's really, really important to be capturing visitor emails in the tasting room, right? That being said, we found that only about 23% uh, of orders of tasting room orders had a customer record or had an email associated with them. So about 77% of orders, uh, you know, they're just kind of anonymous guest checkouts, not capturing any tasting room data, uh, not capturing any, sorry, customer data on these orders here, right? Only about 23% of orders uh, actually got the email there. Really important to get the email for a number of reasons. We took a look at uh, how well wineries were performing on our platform in terms of capturing emails. So what percentage of their tasting room orders had an email associated with them? We found that the bottom 10 wineries on our platform in terms of uh, that email capture rate, they're getting the email about 3.3% of the time. And the top 10% of, or sorry, the top 10 individual wineries with, uh, in terms of uh, email capture rate, uh, they were getting uh, the email about 69% of the time. So pretty big difference there between, you know, the worst performers versus the best performers. And we found a huge impact uh, measuring these two cohorts here, right? When we looked at that bottom cohort, we found that for every dollar they sold in the tasting room, they're selling about 18 cents online. Uh, whereas the top 10 wineries for every dollar they sell in the tasting room, they sell about 78 cents online. So, you know, huge difference there between uh, the, the, the bottom 10 and the top 10. Uh, we ran these numbers last year as well. And the results were very similar, right? We saw once again, that the wineries who take the time to capture the email in the tasting room, they're able to remarket to the visitors after they've gone home and they're able to get uh, a much higher uh, e-commerce sales just based off that, right? Every dollar they're selling in the tasting room, they sell much more online versus uh, the winers who don't capture the email in the tasting room. Uh, we have some more data around this as well. We, uh, we followed those consumers who had uh, their, their emails captured. So we took a look at all the, the customers who uh, were created by an initial tasting room order, right? They came into the tasting room, they bought for the first time, for the first time you captured their email address. And we followed these customers, uh, you know, through, uh, through their lifetimes with the, with the different wineries. We found that the, when the customers who were getting their email captured in the tasting room, and that was where the initial contact was created, we found that about 23% of the time, these consumers were making a web order, right? An e-commerce order in the future. And about 13% of the time, they were actually signing up for the club at a future date, right? So when they got the emails, 23% of those people were ordering online in the future. 13% of them were signing up for the club in the future. So pretty impactful here. Right. So we have a question, Zach. Are, mm -hmm. um, are most wineries tracking cl subscription club members together with traditional club members? Or how do you see it separately in the data? Yeah, so we segmented in the data by um, their different features in our platform. So in Commerce 7, there's essentially three types of clubs. There's a traditional club where uh, everything is basically controlled by the winery. 
There's the user choice club where to a degree or to within restrictions preset by the winery, the member is able to control the products that they receive. And then there's the subscription club, which allows the member within restrictions preset by the winery to control the products, the shipment frequency, the shipment date, and they can also get their own unique curated default package each time. So the system segments those three out in terms of going over our data here, we combine the traditional and the user choice. Uh, so all those metrics are together. And then we, um, you know, we have the subscription kind of as it's, as it's standalone segment there. Okay. So Zach, I love seeing the data support for things that we've that we've known for years. Uh, wineries who are good at contact data capture, it's usually over 60, you know, 65% of the time it's happening. And the wineries who are bad at it are less than 5%. And it's almost like there's no middle. Yeah. And when we track it back, when we track it back to what's going on, it gets into the DNA culture of the winery and have we made it important? <laughs> Like, have we made it important enough that everybody understands the power of these last three slides? Because we're gonna, if we don't capture the contact data, if we're just gonna hit that, you know, oh, I'm busy, I'm gonna hit that guest checkout button and not fill in the other information. We're not gonna have any of these additional sales that we were talking about, the extra 78 cents per dollar in the tasting room, um, these additional web orders, these additional club signups, we're gonna miss 100% of the shots that we're not um, that we're not taking. Exactly. So that's the deep dive there. At this point, I'm going to pass it back to, uh, to Leslie to go over kind of the lessons uh, that we've learned here and that we can implement in, uh, in 2022 here. Great. So picking up, uh, picking up uh, just a couple ideas uh, after my conversations with Remy and Zach and looking at these numbers, a couple themes emerged for me of what we're seeing from OIS Wineries too, is Okay, for the tasting room, trap in most places, traffic is back. The consumer is actually there. It's often back in a way that we can't even handle it. And so I know we have labor, I know we have labor challenges, labor shortages, and um, labor challenges, labor shortages. And, um, but we have to just map what our guest experience is to the assets that we do have. Okay, so even if we're receiving fewer visitors because of reservation systems or because we only have seated private experiences, don't let that deter you because your average order size and your conversion rates will be more than enough to make up for what we were doing pre-COVID. And if you're stretched on not having enough staff, I would much rather see wineries be closed on a couple of days midweek. I mean, I, yes, I wanna get back open to seven days, but do what you do well. <laughs> and if you don't have enough staff to do it well, then fine, uh, you know, you can add back those days later, uh, later as, um, as the labor market will inevitably correct over time. So adapting to those new realities is, we, we have a lot of positives, so let's make sure we're designing our guest experience to key in on it. Another thing that even if we were seeing fewer visitors, that last point that Zach just said is we have to leverage the visitors we have. We need to stop using that, you know, add guest checkout. We need to find multiple ways to salt into the guest experience a reason for people to stay in touch. Another thing that we're seeing is that because the majority of wineries have shifted to online re to reservation only, and the majority are staying there, even though they may have a oh, table or two uh, just to, to do some walk-ins, the majority are staying reservation only. What's happened is the, the unintended consequences are some bad habits from some of our team members because Pre-COVID, we knew we had to be asking and inviting people to stay in touch to gather that contact data capture. Now, a lot of our team members say, oh, that's done with reservations. I no longer have to worry about that. Well, if that's the case, it means we're only capturing contact data from the one individual who made the reservation. Uh, we're not getting contact data from other people in the party. And really importantly, we need contact data from both members of a couple. We have no idea within one couple in front of us, 
who the decision maker is. We have no idea who actually opens their email and who doesn't. And so this good news on the reservation side, we're getting people with, um, with intention that are coming and they're converting more. The bad news is because we've, we've gotten lazy about it is we are missing the contact data capture from everybody else. So strongly encourage you to, um, strongly encourage you to keep that in mind and let's, uh, and let's stop missing those shots we're not taking. On the digital side, we talked about it before, I call it writing the wave. It's like the consumers there, they're buying online. It's changed dramatically since, um, dramatically since we, um, dramatically since we, uh, <clears throat> since pre-COVID, and so this is the time to invest. This is the time. Remember, there was that 30% that 30 of customers who have even beaten their 2020 numbers. Those are the ones they are making it a priority. They're leaning in. They're making it more important than ever. If you're going to invest in technology, be more proactive, this is the time to do it. The winds to your back, to mix metaphors. Ride the wave because it's absolutely there. But don't just stop there. And that gets into leverage this online engagement that's happening. We were not seeing pre-COVID the level of signups that were obviously for subscription, like Zach talked about, but traditional club members and for virtual experiences. The wineries who are really focusing their websites to make sure like, okay, great, they're here, we're selling them wine, but we also wanna sell them or connect them with this ongoing relationship. And so make sure front and center, you have a way and on your website, they're inviting new members into the fold and new, um, and new people within your community who might be interested in virtual experiences because they're there, let's take advantage of it. So with the same level of, of enthusiasm and somewhat first forcefulness of saying, please, please, please capture contact data in the tasting room. It, now this is please, please, please make sure that your website is really inviting a longer term relationship with the people who are visiting you online. A couple of other accelerators uh, as we go into as we go into different channels. And I see we have a couple raised hands. Uh, Tristan, for someone to be able to ask a question, we're gonna need to make them a panelist. And um, if that doesn't work, then we just ask them to, raise, uh, to put their question into chat or Q&A. Tristan, we'll get back to all of you on that. Okay, so, and uh, first accelerator is we talked before, Zach gave a fantastic example of if we get our club members to personalize, well, first of all, what's the importance of getting club members to personalize, we're going to get them out of passive into active mode. You know, before I go on, I'm going to ask um, our friend from Joseph Phelps to take yourself off mute and ask your question. Gonna take yourself off mute, please. Okay, hopefully they will. Uh, oh, hopefully. Okay, we got tech problems. We've got Patrick. Would you want to ask your question? Sorry, guys. Actually, I'm no longer. Okay, my uh, my apologies. We seem to have technical difficulties. Please put your questions into chat or into Q and A, and we'll be happy to answer it. Okay, back to the accelerator. We saw with Zach, we were talking about if we can get club actives meaning people who just go beyond that passive shipment into doing anything active. One way is personalizing their orders. Second is visiting the winery. Third is doing a virtual experience. Anything, if we can get them out of passive mode into active mode, if we were actually running the retention or um, attrition rates of those two camps, passives versus actives, the lifetime value and tenure of it will be much longer. And so all of these activities of which uh, of which Zach gave a, um, is a, sorry, sorry, I'm distracted by, uh, distracted by some chat. 
we're having technical difficulties that we're not able to give you permission to unmute. I apologize about that. Um, please do just put your question in chat and we'll be happy to answer it. The next accelerator is, and we didn't really talk about it in the data yet so far here, but one big lesson from COVID that we got as we are getting better at capturing contact data and then doing something with it is inviting our customers into virtual experiences and into phones. So don't forget that we saw, but what we saw wineries kind of fall into two separate camps, meaning let's use virtual experiences or VX as we call it as an example. When COVID first hit and tasting rooms shut down, a lot of people pivoted to VX. And then when tasting rooms opened, they said, oh my gosh, all the effort went back to just running tasting room. But there is a subset of wineries who said, wow, not only did phone and virtual save our bacon during, um, during the tasting room shutdowns, but what if we were really trying? What if we were investing in these channels and they found way to go forward and do it all? And I know it's hard in tight labor markets, but those wineries who said, this is not, um, this is not flexible, it's not in or out, depending on what's happening in the tasting room, we are committed to these channels long-term, have seen exponential growth. And this is leading to, uh, and this is leading to, uh, what's happening on the organizational front. A lot of the wineries that we're having conversations with about strategy going forward, given the trends that we're seeing on consumer direct and that all channels can be up if we are emphasizing it, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing, is what does the organization and team need to look like going forward? We're seeing more and more wineries actually invest in what we call utility players. And by that, I mean, uh, and I know this seems <clears throat> for some wineries now like, gosh, we're just trying to find enough people to staff the tasting room. We don't have any extra bandwidth. The bandwidth will come back and keep trying and hiring. We're starting to see some of that coming back as well. The utility players concept is with some thoughtfulness, cross-training team members to, to use their skill sets across channels. So People who are great in tasting room, a subset of them can also be phenomenal on the phone. They can be phenomenal in virtual experiences. The only thing we need to do is get their confidence up around those nuances. And so we're seeing more and more wineries develop a more agile and flexible team by doing this. Now then that leads to what should the direct-to-consumer organization structure look like going forward? We've been very siloed in the past. We have tasting room and club and phone and virtual and digital and not a lot of overlap. But as we come up with more utility players, how are we going to get them to optimize across channels? And what do we need to do to change our incentive compensation structures going forward? So um, with this, and so those are just some ideas. Remy and Zach, any other things that you see on the horizon for 2022 where you would like your winery partners to be focusing? Uh, on my side, I'm always surprised to see um, uh, some low hanging fruits in terms of customer analysis, segmentation and specific targeting campaigns. Uh, I mean, I, I would invite every winery right now to go for their list of active club members who have never ordered on their website. I think they would be surprised by the amount of people it could represent. A, a simple segmentation like that. And I'm also always surprised not to see more wineries going into telesales. Uh, it is such a strong channel for the wineries who are really good at it and who are really investing at it. We are all bombarded with so many emails. I don't even look at them anymore when, you know, with all these cyber deals and all that. When was the last time a winery called me yeah. to sell me wine? <laughs> and Zach, how about you? It. Yeah, for yeah, myself. No, I... Go ahead. Go ahead, Zach. Sorry. I was going to say, um, no, I think there's a huge opportunity to get, uh, to get online signups. You know, you saw over COVID, there was a massive amount of people who were going to the winery website who were purchasing wine online. You saw wine subscriptions like Wink just have you know, phenomenal growth. 
Uh, but you didn't see, you know, I don't know about you, Remy, but from our data, we didn't see that, uh, you know, many signups uh, over COVID, right? Strong online sales. People are coming to the site. They're not, they're buying wine on the website. They're signing up for other wine subscriptions. They weren't signing up for the club online. And I think with some minor tweaks and some changes there, you know, that could be a very different story. I think as if, if you kind of out online, you outline the value of signing up for the club as an online member, you know, highlight the convenience, highlight the flexibility, concern handle. Number one concern with anybody subscribing to anything is they don't want the commitment. And uh, I know a lot of wineries have a lock-in because, you know, they have great uh, localized benefits, free tastings, things like that. You don't want people to just sign up and get the benefits and not get the wine. Uh, but, you know, you have to consider how that impacts the online signups. And I think there's a huge opportunity to drive a lot of online signups here. And I think maybe there is a segmentation to do also between, let's say, subscription clubs yep. that may appeal to people that are, don't live nearby the, the winery, mm -hmm. but they're, you know, they're, they're far away and they will, they're not going to be interested in free tasting, you know, yeah. because they can physically not go to the tasting room. Uh, so subscriptions could appeal to these people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, maybe your more local customers would be interested in a more traditional club where they have the benefits of being nearby the tasting room. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's... And it that, goes uh... back to segmentation, 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 and doing, you know, the right marketing campaign for the right group of people. Exactly. Your club today, it's doing a fantastic job of converting uh, tasting room visitors Right. And you're, you know, it's, we looked at the data, the right clubs are growing here. Not at all saying to kind of change what you're doing with that, but uh, if there's an opportunity to have this maybe in addition to your already successful club, something more geared towards uh, the segment that's going to be online or non local there that's looking for the convenience and the flexibility. And so here, uh, here is an idea for wineries. Go ahead. I mean, if you use one person, you can do that easily. Otherwise, Look at your customers. Let's say the customers who have ordered multiple times online without necessarily visiting the tasting room. You may have here a subset of potential uh, club members who would be interested in a subscription, as an example. I've got a couple of questions in that are coming in in Q&A. First of all is we see a lot of channel managers who are overly protective of their customers. What is the best practice to encourage the thought, um, encourage the thought that the customers belong to all channels? What well, gets to the thing in my lower, lower right hand, um, lower right hand quadrant here is rethink the structure and really how we do incentive compensation. Um, Going into COVID, there, and not, it's not even COVID related. It's just a tradition has been that for most winery direct to consumer team members, that the majority of their strong majority, if not 100% of their incentive compensation is channel specific. However, wineries who are really successful at this have always had a percentage for all team members of the whole company meeting or be or exceeding the D2C plan, whether it's on a quarterly basis or every six months or, or annually, um, you know, really depends on other things going on. That's a longer conversation. But what we have seen is two things shifting as these other channels have become much more important and we need our utility players to play across the board and we need channel managers not to be protective of my customer. So first of all, it's not any one channel's customer. The customer has a relationship with our winery brand. And every time we are letting our backstage show, meaning the customer could feel spoken or unspoken a disconnect between channels, that's not the way it should work because they have a relationship with our brand and we need our business to be channel agnostic. It's their choice whether they visit us, call us, join a club, do a virtual tasting, answer the phone, whatever. And so, but to change behavior is we need to change how we pay people. And so if um, when I, what we're seeing is, yes, we want to celebrate and reward people for channel excellence and create incentives and carrots there, but we also want to equally uh, reward our team members for contributing to direct to consumer overall. So what we're seeing is that the umbrella incentive compensation program that goes for beating the entire consumer direct goals, um, we're seeing those percentages go up. 
in terms of for someone's total incentive comp, where is it coming from? Channel, you know, individual specific, team specific, or overall D2C umbrella. We're seeing changes there. And so uh, Angela had asked, can we email a recording of this? Yes, we are recording it and happy to send it out to all participants who, uh, who would uh, like to do it. Are there any, uh, any other questions? And sorry about the uh, technical difficulty. We, we now understand if you do want to ask something live is if we invite you to become a panelist, you need to turn your camera on. And when you turn your camera on, then, uh, then you should be able to, to speak. Okay, Zach, what have we not talked about that we should have? Yeah, I think, uh, I think we went through a lot of great content here. I think that, um, yeah, I think maybe we could, you know, more emphasis on uh, well, you went over the the virtual experiences, keeping those around. You know, just like uh, just like e-commerce is here to stay. You know, I, I know that that we kind of all agree here that the virtual experiences, the webinars, the other events like that. You know, those are definitely here to stay. Yes, some people might be burned out of those, just like some people people might be burned out of buying online. They want to go in store, but you know, there's definitely got to be still a subsection of uh, consumers here who are really you know that's a new behavior for them, and it's one that's going to stick. Right. Yeah, I strongly uh, believe that as well with that virtual is here to stay. We're in kind of, I call it the virtual 2.0 zone uh, in terms of we've learned a lot over the past 21 months and what it looks like in the, in the future is there's strong extension for club member benefits and virtual. Um, the virtual towards co corporate is huge and we and we only have an and only the tip of the iceberg we're seeing more and more wineries going back to that organizational structure standpoint rethink through how they serve all corporate clients so uh, you know companies who came and did events on property companies who sent holiday gifts over the years and now companies who are using it for virtual experiences for entertaining their customers or their team members and we're seeing wineries go it's almost like we do on key accounts on trade sales, kind of key account management on corporate and really focusing, again, not channel specific, how can we serve? We think that's really here, clear here to stay. Um, Brian Baker has asked the question, and I think we set it up front, but I'll ask you to repeat, what's the data size of your respective cohorts um, for Remy, for yours? Like how many wineries are in that data? And uh, 150 now. 150 for Remy, Zach, how about you? About 750, and uh, we are international, but about 80% of those are U.S. wineries. Okay. I excluded the non-U.S. wineries. We have a few in Canada, Australia, so they're not part of the data set. Okay, super. And a great way to wrap, Leslie John from Pangloss has asked the question, uh, what's next? This was a learning series with three topics. This is the three of, uh, three, of three series. We would be more than happy uh, to continue conversations like this going forward. In terms of what's next, I think, uh, Zach, we should get a question out to uh, mm -hmm. these groups as a follow-up to this of saying, what subject matters are you interested in? And we're happy to take periodic uh, deep dives into it. Exactly. Yeah, you, you tell us what's next. Yeah. So, we'll, so, uh, so stay tuned. We will be asking you and happy to be of service in any way we can with that. I'm going to uh, bid adieu and thank you so much, Remy, for your time and your numbers and thank you. your data uh, and Zach for your data and your insights. And thank you everybody for carving out an hour in your day and spending it with us.